So, in case you missed it, Disney's making a live-action version of The Little Mermaid. I'm really excited. I love mermaids, all the stories associated with them, and all the images and symbolism associated with them as well. I even had a transformable Ariel doll, similar to this picture. If you take her tail off, she has human legs underneath. Beyond Disney's cartoon, I also love the sea ponies from My Little Pony. If you know this cartoon, you've probably already gotten that theme song stuck in your head. But if I have to be honest, there was one change to The Little Mermaid that really disappointed me when I was a kid. And no, I'm not talking about her skin color. I'm talking about the Disney fight ending to Hans Christian Andersen's classic tale. In this video, I want to use recent debate about Disney casting an African-American actress as Ariel to delve into the history of The Little Mermaid, as well as touch on Disney's sketchy history with black characters. I'm going to start with a story that the 1989 Disney film is based on. Danish author Hans Christian Andersen published Little Mermaid in 1837. That version is much more harsh, hearkening back to tales like the Brothers Grimm. For example, the Little Mermaid's tongue is cut out as payment to the sea witch. The first animated version I saw of this film wasn't the Disney version. It was actually this 1975 Japanese version. This version, with a blonde mermaid named Marina, follows Anderson's version a little more closely than the Disney cartoon. While there's no cut-out tongues or aching feet that felt like they're walking on knives, it does keep the original ending. Anderson's original story and the Japanese version, the mermaid doesn't wind up with the prince. Instead, the mermaid doesn't fulfill that bargain without any interference from the sea witch, who, by the way, is a much more minor character. The mermaid doesn't die, exactly, but she is transformed into sea foam or bubbles. In the original, she's saved by the mystical Daughters of the Air, and if she performs good deeds for 300 years, she can earn herself a human soul, as mermaids do not have souls in this story. In the Japanese cartoon, she just ascends into heaven as rainbow bubbles, while the prince looks on in shock. That's heavy. No happy ending for the little mermaid. Instead, there's a harsh lesson. Maybe it's for disobeying her father. Maybe it's for giving up an essential part of herself in order to get a man. But in the original, there's no happy moment when the Little Mermaid is walking towards her prince, wearing a sparkly dress. I remember seeing the 1989 film in theaters and being a little disappointed by how Disney changed the ending. Honestly, this wasn't the same mermaid story I'd read about or seen in the Japanese cartoon. I still love the themes. I've been self-conscious about my voice since I was a kid, and a part of me wanted to trade my own voice for a different life and different body. Something about Ariel's outsiderness, both on land and in sea, really struck a chord with me. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I could really explain why I was disappointed with this ending, or Ariel gets her prince. It just seems a little hollow. The symbolism of giving up your voice in exchange for love is completely gone in, in Disney's version. Ariel just becomes another Disney princess with a happy ending. It wasn't until I was a teenager that I understood why I identify with Ariel's otherness so much. After it came out as bisexual, being drawn to mermaids made sense. Ariel's love was taboo in society, and so was my attraction to women. Which leads me back to the announcement that Disney is casting African-American singer Holly Bailey as Ariel. Predictably, an angry backlash followed as people took to social media to complain about a black actress being cast to play, to play a mermaid. Social justice warriors are ruining Western cinema, and so on. A couple of things about this, ignoring the racist implications for now. One, Anderson doesn't mention the mermaid's hair color in his story, just that she has long hair. And second, Disney already made a major change to the story in their version when they changed Anderson's tragic ending. Furthermore, The Little Mermaid is not a unique story. It comes from a long tradition. For example, there's a German story, Undine, published in 1811, in which a water nymph marries a knight in order to get a human soul. Or even older, the French story of Melusine, from the 1300s, about a water spirit who is married to a human man and in tragedy, when he can't keep his end of the bargain. Or the Cornish story, The Mermaid of Zenor, about a mysterious woman with a lovely singing voice. Or Scottish Selkies, seals become human on land when they remove their seal coats. 
and the men who try to trap them by stealing their coats. European folk folklore is full of such stories ill-fated marriages between a human and a mythological creature. This type of story isn't unique to European folklore, either. The Ojibwe in North America have a similar story to mermaids called Nebunabe. Ojibwe scholar and storyteller Basil Johnston describes Nebunabe as living in the water and trying to lure partners into the water with them, to live in their underwater world, the realm of sleep. For an ancient version, and the likely grandmother of mermaid legends, we need to look to Greece. The sirens from Homer's Odyssey have beautiful singing voices and try to lure men to their deaths. While the sirens are originally part bird, their captivating voices are a trait that many water nymph legends share, including the Little Mermaid. This is also why there's no exact body type for water nymphs or mermaids. Some look like regular women, while others, like this pair from the 1300s, look kind of like half fish or half bird. I'm bringing up these examples to show that to claim there's a standard or canon to The Little Mermaid is a little strange. Anderson even references Undine in a letter to his friend, making it clear he was very aware of these other mermaid stories when he was writing his own. Now we need to dig into Disney's past issues with, with racist imagery. You ready? This is going to get pretty bad. Ah, oh, damn it, Disney. I love the film Fantasia as a kid, and I'll never be able to watch it the same way. Fantasia was a series of cartoons all set to classical music. This was from 1940, from the Pastoral Symphony. And that centaur has a nickname Sunflower, for the yellow flower in her hair. If you don't remember her, it's for good reason. Due to her looks, the exaggerated lips, and the hairstyle, and how she's nothing more than a maid to the other more feminine centaurs, Sunflower was, was removed from releases of Fantasia after 1960. She's edited out, and in some cases, the camera is zoomed in so you can't see her. In recent years, some artists have begun to reclaim Sunflower, drawing the black centaur as pretty and sensual. In the original, though, she's only the maid. She waits on the white centaurs, and while all the other centaurs pair up, there's no black boyfriend for her. It's not just that her appearance reflect racist stereotypes of the time. She's just a plain servant, not a seductive centaur like the others. That message itself, that white women are pretty and deserve to be pampered, while black women are not pretty and should be in serving roles, is as ugly as it is old, and is embedded in a lot of movies. Sunflower and the other black centaurs are hardly the only racist characters Disney has had. There's the Crows in Dumbo, released in 1941, and the entire movie The Song of the South from 1946, which has never been released in a full version for purchase, likely due to its glossing over reconstruction. There's also this racist caricature of a Chinese cat playing the piano with chopsticks in the Aristocats. <laughs> The way Native Americans are depicted in Peter Pan, and even the way Arabs are shown in Aladdin, have all been criticized for promoting nasty, outdated stereotypes. Where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face, it's barbaric, but hey, it's home. Which is one of the first things I thought of when I saw the new Ariel about the steps Disney has been taking to be more respectful and to make its characters more diverse by giving us heroines that lots of little girls can relate to. Like recently, Tiana in Princess and the Frog, set in New Orleans, which featured a mostly black cast. And I love how some people have tried to argue that, because of the Danish folktale originally, Ariel should look Danish, despite her American accent and flaming red hair. Or hearing some people argue about melanin in the skin, that Ariel would need to be black if she lived under the water. I mean, come on. She doesn't have gills or a blowhole, yet she can breathe underwater. She also can swim to really crazy depths, and apparently with no ill side effects. You're okay with a half fish, half human, but not if that human half is black? Please. 
Do I need to mention the classic mermaid problem? That of how, well, how do mermaids make more little baby mermaids? What the hell is that? Yeah, I'm a little confused too. How do I, you know, with the tail and all? I'm not your first, am I? I mean, I, I lay my eggs, then I leave, and you release your fertilizer. <laughs> Why couldn't she be the other kind of mermaid, with the fish part on top and the lady part on the bottom? This, of course, is a humorous way to describe the classic tragedy of the mermaid, and why marriages between humans and mermaids rarely work out. There's something very identifiable and even universal in the mermaid story of otherness, about being unsure of what world you belong to, of questioning your identity. This is why I was drawn to the story of the Little Mermaid as a child. Her desires were forbidden by society, as were my own. Since coming out as a teenager, I've seen more and more queer people adopt mermaids for different reasons. As an Evelyn of the trans community, for example, as with the trans advocacy group Mermaids in the UK. There's also been speculation about Anderson's sexuality as well, with no definitive answers if he's straight or gay. However, the Little Mermaid's quest for a soul and to be united with her love is something Anderson mentioned wanting for himself in his letters. Despite my feelings about the ending of the Disney cartoon, I did like Ariel. While there was something poignant about the Little Mermaid learning a lesson about giving up her voice to be with a man, there was also something exhilarating about Ariel being rewarded for her passionate, rebellious spirit. She was so different than the other princesses. I'm, and I'm excited that a new generation will get to discover her. Shoot.